Excuse me, Gagan. Please. Yeah, uh, we are starting the recording now. The whole thank, thank you, Sharad. Thank you so much. So we started the recording. Thank you so much. So uh, we took a strategic time out. Uh, you know, a lot happened around the globe, uh, as we all know. So, and also we were, we were discussing with Troy. We wanted to kind of see if we can try different things, and that was the whole idea. So um, what we what we have for you today is uh, an interesting discussion, hopefully. And uh, the only way this discussion will be value adding and meaningful is when we kind of voice our opinion, voice our, make it interactive, all right? Uh, so before I get into this, I, I invited Troy for being a guest speaker. And you know we were discussing and then he said, Dagan, I'm going to give all the mantras which I have learned only on one free condition. I'm like, what is that, Troy? Uh, and he said that, Gagan, uh, you'll have to allow me to ask one question to this beautiful group which is there. And uh, I would love to hear and learn from their views. How will they tackle that question? So one, so it's a Q&A with Troy, but post that, Troy would also last, like to ask all of us a question. We'll use technology to kind of accumulate those answers and then open it up for discussion. Uh, Sharad, if you could move on to the next one, please. So, uh, it's a very simple agenda. As usual, we have a case study from straight bat, which you always have a trivia, uh, which is building on all the trivias which we mentioned before. We'll have a, a straight talk with Troy. It's a Q and A, uh, you know, planning his life of as a coach. Uh, and then we have this open house, which Troy will uh, put forth. A rather easy question, I must say. Cool. So, next, please. <coughs> So uh, one interesting case study, which we, are, we wanted to share with you, backed by solid data from straight bat, was uh, we, we saw around the globe, and this is not uh, particular to a particular geography, a particular team around the globe, where we saw that players are practicing differently and playing differently. Are they preparing, uh, are they planning their training sessions for the match they're going to play? This is just an example of few, an elite player somewhere from the globe. We keep the player's name completely anonymous, right? Where he was training for a T20 game. Look at his swing speed, which is at 30s and impact speed at 30s. His, he really, really went hard during the game. Then he started, he moved to one days. There he started practicing uh, at pretty hard speed and uh, a wider angle, back angle. So he was really going hard. But in the game, again, uh, he was very different. He actually went down to very lower speed. At this point, uh, actually one of the coaches right here in this uh, group, uh, and he mentioned Chris Buck. Uh, Buck was there and Buck discussed with them and said that why there's a difference. And the player said that, you know what, you don't want me to play like a millionaire in the game. All right? I need to take my chance. I, I need to settle down and take, take some time. And uh, Buck said exactly what I want you to do in the nets. I don't want you to play like a millionaire in the nets. You don't have to play so many balls. You have to play according to a match situation. You have to practice according to a match situation. You have to mentally visualize the match situation and practice. Right? And then before the second one day, there was a few training sessions which really mapped to uh, what he actually did in, in the one-day game. So what we saw is that when somebody is training for the way he would like to play in the match, mentally simulate the scenarios, sometimes play in the center wicket, understand where the gaps are, really, really in the game, uh, feel the heat, feel the, you know, plan with the new ball if he's an opening batsman and play accordingly and do not just play the nets to hit the balls. It makes a huge difference. We all know that, quite frankly, what I'm sharing is not known to anybody in this group. It is backed by data. That your training and match are very different. You don't want that. Get it aligned. Train for the matches. And by the way, this, uh, the second inning, the one day game, he actually played a beautiful, beautiful knock. Uh, just a thought, uh, an interesting case study for you that players are not probably being accountable for themselves when they're training to prepare for the match. And this is not just particular to a geography. Uh, next slide, please. This is the trivia, uh, which you always want to. This is other part. This is not something other than the case study. If you mentioned, uh, if you remember uh, in the first straight talk, we 
um, we shared with you that left handers bat speed and impact speed in the offside is 20 to 30 percent more than that of the right handers we were digging deep into it and you know so on and so forth and we wanted to understand rational one of the rational is that left handers are very very uh, used to facing right arm over and the ball goes away from them and there's a free flow of the arm but we wanted to see a bit more and we dig deeper what we realized that is those left handers right handers with similar initial bat lift and the widest bat angle during the bat lift if you look at those kind of sets of players and you compare the left handers and the right handers you will see that at the top of the bat lift when the bat lift at the topmost at when they are playing in the offside their bat angle is 12 degree closer than that of right handers they are more in line or direction where they want to play and that's when they're generating more speed they're not cutting across the line right uh, so de depending on where you are playing it should change left handers have a much straighter bat angle there when you're playing in the off and maneuvering than the that of right handers it was very interesting again for coaches to see and think about uh, we are presenting data right uh, next slide please with this uh, if there's any uh, pertinent questions or we can take at the end also but uh, just wanted to throw really really specific data insights to you 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 find mind about cricket which probably you've not seen uh, with this i wanted to formally welcome troy uh, troy is a head coach at ncc uh, national cricket center in brisbane uh, it's a state of art center who those who have not seen probably should see it's, uh, it's in the great chapel street uh, uh, out of just in the suburbs of Brisbane, uh, and he's a bowling coach of Australian men's team. Uh, I think I sent uh, you guys his profile. He was the uh, England bowling coach during the Ashes, the famous Ashes in 2005, and then he took over a post his stint in England uh, as an NCC head coach, uh, filling in shoes of his mentor, uh, one of his mentors, Greg Chapel. Uh, Troy and me. Uh, met him in 2019 may uh, actually before that in Bra in bangalore when, I, when we showed straight bat rahul and me showed straight bat to him he got excited and he now he's one of our very very esteemed customer again uh, a tough customer uh, really pushy he doesn't believe every data has to be make, make, making sense it has to make sense to per percolate down he had some very very interesting discussions i must say that he has actually published some seven or eight case studies based on straight bat analysis within the cricket Australian fraternity. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Troy, for joining in. Much really appreciate this. Thank you, Gagan, for the uh, introduction. Um, and thank you for everyone for coming in. I, I think these, uh, these sessions are invaluable. And uh, we get a chance to, to talk to each other and share knowledge. And uh, I think that's probably you know, one thing that I've tried to instill in myself all the time, you, you never know enough. And I suppose um, looking at um, the two presentations we've had already, you know, from, from Greg and from Zubin, it's just, uh, it's just a great opportunity to, to first of all, listen to, um, to them and then to maybe give you a bit of a story today and then to ask some key questions at the end so we can all share this information uh, around this great game that we all are passionate about. So uh, thank you, Gagan, for the opportunity and thank everyone uh, for uh, their time. I hope I don't stuff it up. If I do, then um, you can blame uh, Gagan, okay? <laughs> I take all the blame, guys. Hey, yeah. uh, Sharad, do you mind sharing the slides again? There's a beautiful picture which I wanted to share, buddy. Sharad, if you could share the slide. So there's this picture, which, uh, you know, uh, next slide, please. And I, I looked at it and I asked uh, Troy, so huh. what is Queen Elizabeth and you talking about? And uh, uh, this was probably in ashes, during the ashes or before the ashes. Troy, over to you. What was, what was here happening, yeah, please? What was happening? Well, apart from me being scared shitless, um, I had the Queen and the Duke in a little office and it was uh, quite ironic that that office was the sports science office. And uh, <laughs> I was asked to present to the Queen, who was obviously England and funded a lot of money 
into this brand new building in England. And uh, wow, yeah. So basically there, um, we're presenting um, why we've spent all England's money and um, why they've brought this Tasmanian kid across to England um, to uh, show them how to put a pace bowling program together. So I was pretty, uh, pretty nervous there and uh, I probably got a little bit more nervous when um, they asked me a, a little question, which was basically, with all, this, all these resources and all this technology you've got, is it going to make him bowl any better? And it was a genuine question from the Duke, actually. And uh, he was quite a funny man, those who met him. And uh, it was probably right there and then that I basically could either tell a lie or the truth. And I basically said, well, I think it's going to help them bowl. And I suppose for me, that was me in my journey um, of getting to where I was there was getting a little bit of the art and the science mixed in together and starting to take a few of those conventional wisdom things and putting a little bit of science around it. And uh, I put my hand on my heart and I think I did tell the truth in that room right there and then, even though I was um, pretty, pretty nervous at the time. But yeah, I, I think we could move the needle and make them and help these young fast bowlers and even the older fast bowlers it could help them become better. And that, oh. was, probably the, that was probably what uh, that picture was all about. But a very proud moment, of course, you know, but uh, also one of the most scariest moments. You, you asked that one question, you need to answer. Move the needle, very interesting. And uh, I think the session is about moving the needle. Uh, I think you've been asked many a times, uh, Troy, but from a coaching perspective, right? 2005, the Ashes, um, India, uh, England uh, taking back the Ashes after 18 years, if I remember right. And uh, I must say, probably you had a pivotal role. I mean, English seamers bowling reverse swing, swing, taking the ball away, no Asian team, no Asian conditions. Uh, there was needle moved. I mean, wh what went in it? I mean, was it something which was just during the series they found they could swing the ball? Or there was something which went into it as a strategy and as an execution? Um, well, let me answer that question. Um, I won't answer it with a question like I normally do, but I suppose what I, when I originally got to England, um, I was there for a role. A Rod Marsh had got me across um, to help set up the national, or a national program, Pace Bowling, which was more like, for me, was going to be the conveyor belt um, for England. And I suppose when, when I got there, um, I was doing, you know, I was doing a reasonable job. I obviously got through the discussion with the Queen and the Duke, okay, and uh, they didn't behead me or anything like that. But I was quickly sort of moved into the, the senior role with the men. And, and I suppose to sort of come around that question a little bit, um, when I moved into that role, um, I was probably sitting there thinking, well, <laughs> as a coach, what have I got to work with? And how am, I gonna, how am I gonna get this thing to work if I'm gonna go into this team? And I suppose what I was looking at at that stage there was <coughs> as a fast bowler and, and um, what underpinned my, my, my sort of, um, my thinking was, we need to take wickets, <laughs> which is the art of fast bowling. We need to take wickets. And I had a look across and I had a, and, and looked at what resources we had there and then. And I suppose what I was doing, and I'm going to use Mother Nature here because she was helping me decide on what sort of skills we had to take wickets. And then I looked around and uh, I used, uh, you used Mother Nature. We, we need to get bats and out, don't we? Um, and to do that, we need to make, we need to get them to make a mistake. Whatever we do as fast bowls, whatever we do, we've got to, I've got to give it to batsmen here. We've got to, we've got to force them into, into a mistake. And when I was looking around and looking at all the swing and all that sort of stuff and the scene, I knew there's three things we needed to do to, to, to get batsmen into a position where they were going to make a mistake. And as I said, Mother Nature helped me here. There was three things I was working on when I assessed that 
group. One was, uh, and when I go back to it, sorry, it was the flight, fright, or freeze. And I was trying to work out whether we could take the wickets or not. And let me explain that. When I looked around, we had three quicks that bowled over 90 miles per hour. So that was the fright part. Now, anybody who's been in a change room and someone bowls about 90 or upwards miles an hour, you quickly have a look at what that does to batsmen in the room and also everybody else. Some people go to the fright stage straight away. And we know if we get a batsman in that fright stage, we've got a good chance that they'll make a mistake. So we were having a look around there. As, um, we had three bowlers that could get to the fright stage. So I thought, okay, well, there's, a, um, <laughs> there's, there's, there's the majority of the lineup we can get rid of, you know. So there were some other things in that mix as well. And I suppose what I looked at it was, was the, um, the freeze mentality. So when I looked at that group, those bowlers were pretty good at being able to hit a pretty good length, you know. There was Hoggart was, was, was very good at that. Uh, Simon Jones was great at controlling length. And, uh, and, and Flintoff, well, Flintoff, he was a metronome. He was good as well. Harmy, probably not as good, <clears throat> as we all know. But when I looked at that, I thought, wow, we've got an ability to put the freeze on batsmen. And we know when they get into that mode, then we've got an opportunity to them, for them to make a mistake. And I suppose the last one, the last one was the fight one. And when I was looking at that, how are we going to, how are, we going to, how are we going to get the batters out that want to put up a fight? And uh, I suppose what I look there is the things that um, you want to be able to do in that situation is have a few things up your sleeve. And those things are seam. And we know seam is the silent killer of batsmen. And we had good seam. I mean, England players hit the seam. So I looked there, I gave that little box a tick. And I suppose the other one that we looked at was, um, was swing. And swing was the visual killer of batsmen. We know what, as soon as the ball starts swinging around, batters start getting a bit twitchy. And yeah, we could basically put a batter in, in, a, in a bit of a frenzy there and maybe get them to make a mistake. And we had some bowlers in that group that could swing the ball. And I suppose the other one too, and I just sort of said that, uh, that fright one was we had some bowlers that could bowl you know, excess of 90 miles an hour. So I thought, wow, that's a pretty good uh, mix. And uh, how, can, uh, how can that sort of come together? And uh, I suppose I assessed them there. And I suppose there, Gagan, is the swing component was, was a big thing for me um, to be able to then also add a few little dimensions to that as we went along. But we had, a, we had a group of fast bowlers, assessed them um, under the fight, flight and freeze mentality. I think we had a group of bowlers that were um, um, definitely going to be able to bundle together and uh, not forgetting a, a, a left arm spinner as well. And I don't know if Howie's on the, Craig Howard's on the line, but we had a left arm spinner in there that we could, uh, could tie up an end and give our fast bowlers a bit of a rest. But um, I suppose in that group of bowlers when we assessed them, we had some uh, some great, very good swing capabilities already. So that was uh, that was interesting. How do you how did you go about building this uh, if you will business case, business case right? This is the strategy. Uh, you you were mentioning about I don't remember some scientists you got uh, you did some parachute thing. I mean something about that. <laughs> well, a couple of challenges I suppose there were. Um, for that group of bowlers, um, well, two things that I'll, I'll, I'll add to uh, Rabbi, Dr. Rabbi Metra, who I met in England. Um, but there were probably two challenges. That one there were how we were going to try and get them to keep getting better. Um, and that was in the swing department. So I'll touch on that one. And the other one, I suppose, was the, you know, we, we only had four or five at the time, but we had to keep them on the park. So my biggest challenge for those, those two was, uh, for those two challenges was to, to, to obviously get them a bit fitter because I'd just come from Australia where, you know, we had some, well, fitness is a pretty important part of, um, of keeping players on the park. And I suppose that comes to back to the two things that um, we wanted to do. We wanted to take wickets and keep players on the park. So a couple of good challenges in there was, was to actually start to get them fitter. Um, but um, in regards to 
the science and the conventional wisdom versus the science and and obviously that's the art and the science that you know, I was trying to to bring in to the to my coaching and also to to surround myself with to make better decisions yeah dr rabbi metro now is a unique character um, born in pakistan works at nasa and is one of the big and one of the team members that actually builds the parachutes that that the uh, the um, the space shuttle things fall down into the earth on so he was uh, he was in this uh, in this very special part of nasa and uh, he was uh, he was also he loved cricket, mm-hmm. and uh, and he was uh, he grew up with uh, Imran Khan. In fact, you know he showed me a picture of Imran Khan and him in, at school together, mm-hmm. and then he proceeded to tell me about how he learnt and taught everybody how to reverse swing a ball. Mm-hmm. So in 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 that you know England England bowlers can hit the scene beautifully. That's part of their art, and uh, they grow up naturally doing that. I mean, even Harmy on occasion hit the scene. But w- one of the things, uh, and and one of the things they could do as well is they could swing a ball. So that wasn't uh, that wasn't the issues with any of this. It was basically that you know we um, we had an opportunity to start to use this reverse swing, and the doc, the good Dr. Rabbi, basically put a bit of science behind why it swings. Now, you can imagine um, the fast bowlers listening to a scientist. You know, we're talking about the art of fast bowling, not the science of fast bowling. And I suppose that was a bit of a challenge for me to, to basically look at that and just see if we could enhance the ability to swing a ball. And, um, and, I'm, and I'm happy to say that when we sort of went through all this, uh, the bowlers still said, Troy, you can handle that and we'll just take what you get at the end. So... At least we'll be able to, I was able to move the needle slightly with them to start to listen to some of the science that was coming into the game. And, and also some of the co- great conversations I had in the background with, um, with the coaches around the country at the time. You know, um, reverse swing, um, conventional wisdom had put it that, you, you know, you could load it up and reverse it. You could actually, um, that the ball swung differently to the seam. So there was a lot of different things, but we started to put a little bit of science behind it. And some of the facts were starting to come out. We were having some great conversations around this uh, phenomenon, which is the, as I said, it's the visual killer of, uh, of batsmen is the swing. And then I suppose what we did there was we put a little bit of art and science around there and, and uh, started to muck around. We had two fast bowlers that's in that group. That was Flintoff and uh, Simon Jones. We basically, through the evidence um, we looked at, if they could hold the scene really, really upright, you could actually get the ball to go both ways very easily, as opposed to maybe laying the ball off on its side a little bit for, for a swing. And those two bowlers, they were listening with a, with a lot of um, intent uh, on being able to um, extract the swing both ways. Um, and I'll call it a reverse swing because it was going against the shine. But um, yeah, that's that was a great little um, ep- a great little time when I think we started to mix a little bit of the art and science together, and move the needle in in that direction. So interestingly, you basically saying that you use science to tell the bowlers what they can do, right? If they have this lever right, which is holding the seam position correct, beautiful. <laughs> Uh, and then no, you, I, uh, uh, I use science to tell the coaches. I, I use, uh, yeah, I, I try to introduce science to the players, but um, at least they were listening and they moved. And you know, we we, we started practicing a lot more um, with uh, with the with the balls, uh, getting ready for what was a pretty um, couple of dry summers, and then obviously the big dry summer, which was the yeah. two thousand and five Ashes. We were ready then. The coaches, the coaches had been doing their job. You know, they prepared the players. They got them ready. I gave them some skills. We had some skills in that team, as I sort of said. You know, we bundled up some really good resources. Um, we got them a bit fitter. Um, the challenge at that stage was to get Harmison and Flintoff fit. Um, Simon Jones was another one. Obviously, he had a, a massive knee injury. But um, the great thing about the, the two Harmison and Flintoff characters at that time, um, Freddie, who's a fitness fanatic now, as you've seen him on TV, he actually decided he should get fit. And then his mate, which was Harmy, who followed him to the end of the earth, he, he just tagged along and got fit at the same time. So um, 
a little perfect storm was coming together where we had sort of, you know, four really good quicks um, coming together that could put the fight, flight or freeze into the batsmen so they'd make mistakes and we could get them out and we could all go home and have some fun. Awesome. And then Australians took, took, couldn't take it anymore and they got you back. And by the way, uh, they asked you to fill shoes of one of your mentor. So you took over head coach at NCC. Uh, I think it was called MPP before and now NCC. And uh, you took over from Greg, right? Uh, I mean, I'm, you have told many times that he's one of your mentors and so on and so forth. So how was that? And uh, it will be lovely to hear also in these last eight years how you've moved the needle there. What you're trying to do right now. A couple of big challenge there. Because you got, you're trying to do a systematic change to overall coaching development and so on and so forth. So it will be interesting to see her views, how you are developing NCC there. Yeah, well, when I came back here, so I sort of jumped into the Australian team um, and, um, and also started working um, part of that job because the Australians like to get a pound of flesh out of you. So uh, I basically jumped when I came home, um, was able to hook back up with the the program which had moved to Brisbane um, and um, Tim Nielsen was running it at that stage. So I was uh, coaching um, the Australian team, um, not, not, not full time with them, um, but I had a developer role back in with the, with the um, National Academy there for the National Performance Program. It's had a few changes. So I moved back into there and um, look, that was taking some changes even back then. Um, we all know that there was a fair amount of money coming into the system. Um, a lot of the states had started to resource up their programs a lot better. And um, there were probably more coaches around. There was more money around. So more coaches um, came into the, into the game. So the, um, the, the, the sort of the uh, National Academy program, which Rod Maas started off um, all those years ago, which I was, you know, very, very sort of happy to be included in that when it was in Adelaide. I, um, in fact, it actually fueled my, um, my coaching um, aspirations to one day be a head coach. But it's, it was coming home, the, the changes had started to take place. Um, as I said, Tim Nelson was running it. He then got the head coach job. And then I was lucky enough to hook up with the, another old fellow who was a bit of a legend, um, who I had sort of done, a, done a little bit of work. Hey, there he is. I knew I'd get him. Um, Greg Chappell sort of stepped into the role and became the, uh, the grand master of, the, uh, of that national program. And um, to be able to have Rod Marsh sort of mentor me earlier um, through that time when I was trying to get my apprenticeship done and, uh, and build, um, build a bit of a coaching philosophy and, uh, and try and work out where science and art stood where convention and wisdom finished up and all those sort of things. Uh, so I had some, uh, I had a, a really good mentor and then Rod then, but to, to then be able to hook back up with um, GC um, was a pretty special time. And again, that academy was, ta was taking shape. It was all, it's always been evolving. One of, the, one of the great things I think with Australian cricket is it's always, it's always had to um, look at the environment and, and, and really work hard and involve its resources. Obviously, you know, we've, we've got a great climate, but we, we've moved to Brisbane, we're outdoors. Um, GC had come in and with his conventional wisdom, and I know he, he looks at science quite heavily, he was, he, was challenging, he was challenging the way we were training. And it was fantastic um, in the way he was able to just push back against um, some inertia around the states in how we should link our training. And the word game sense comes straight to mind, I suppose, for all of us here. But the way GC started to work with us as coaches under his umbrella and start to really put that mind and that thinking component into your training and put it around that game, I think was, was probably one of, the, uh, one of the, the greatest legacies he's going to leave um, for us in, 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 the, uh, in the National Performance Program. So I was, um, I've, I've been introduced to Game Sense a little bit earlier in, in uh, even in, well, actually when I first arrived in England, um, uh, a man by the name of Rod Thorpe, 
who was one of the uh, one of the deans, I think, of the uh, university there in at Loughborough. He was about to leave, and he he came to the opening and he introduced himself. and I uh, and I thought, uh, "Good day, how are you?" And we had a really good chat about a few things. And then uh, he said, "Oh well, I'm about to leave." He said, "But if look, if you want me to do anything, just ask, because I love cricket, I love sport." And I thought, well, I didn't know much about him at that stage. And when he'd left, I asked a few questions and I found out, <laughs> and this is the ironic thing, I found out that he was the Game Sense guru that went to Australia in the late 1970s and took Game Sense to the school curriculum. So it was a really interesting sort of circle that, uh, of meeting him. And he actually joined our, Nash, or our ECB technical pace bowling group. And uh, I got to know him a fair bit. But when I sort of, we got back to Australia, I started hooking back up with GC and he started talking about this game sense and how he wanted to uh, change the, tra the way we train. It, it made a lot of sense. So, um, you know, I think that was probably a, a great start to um, some of the things that we changed in Brisbane around how we're starting to train people. And again, this game sense was, uh, you know, was a, a pretty cool concept and probably one of the, one of the things that um, I was really keen to keep developing. And, and it had some challenges, no doubt. You know, inertia was in there. You know, nets were pretty easy. You just line people up nets and run them through like a factory. Um, but it was building some, um, building some mind dead thinkers. And uh, I was pretty keen um, to step into some pretty big shoes that GC left and, and continue that on and keep that push uh, of trying to change the way we train and uh, really build into that, uh, that thinking component of the game and bring into the game. And I think that was, um, I think we're starting to see some of that radar being moved now. Um, and you know, and we saw we saw your focus with the video on the different spin programs that you have, which was not there before. I mean, in India, it almost seems like natural what you guys are talking about. But I can, I've been there. I can imagine that getting those spin tracks and not those, you know, drop-in pitches and not playing in those mats made a huge difference to. Oh, because sixty, I believe sixty percent of you uh, of the time you're playing in Asian continent, right? I mean, I yeah, well, have a spin program at all. Yeah, that's pretty. That was a, that was a pretty good statistic. And you know, apart from hitting three lengths with fast bowlers, we you know we we had a huge challenge in Australia. And that's one of the cool things about the national performance program is we got a chance to actually fill some gaps that were in our player development for those players that we were were, were selecting that we thought were going to one day play for their country. So. We were, we were noticing, as, as you do, um, a couple of things. One, that um, the game format that uh, had, was changing the way people were thinking and the, what the fans were wanting. But also, uh, the changing the ground dynamics too. You know, we, had, um, we used to have some, a really, really cool backyard, baggy green playground where, where you could get an organic type of approach to your, your skill development, which would hold you in good stead around most parts of the world. But, but the, the background had changed. You know, we had drop-in pitches um, and, and uh, the, it was becoming quite vanilla in the way that these, uh, what our generation of players were coming through were being exposed to in their natural game. And we, we know, and Greg will, will say all the time, the game is the greatest teacher. Well, our game wasn't producing enough challenges so one of the cool things that we, we, we were able to do in, in Brisbane is try to, try to fill some of those gaps. Because we, you know, we've got to play international. And yes, you're correct. 60% of our games are on international or Asian conditions. So if we were losing the ability to play spin, and we were expected to play spin in those countries and win, because you no know, one wants to be number one in the world, where were we going to teach this where was where was the uh, where was the teaching going to happen? So um, we got together um, and we started to change a few things in Brisbane. And yeah, what you saw there was was a, a change in the way we were looking at filling the gaps that was left in our system. And yeah, we we changed the pitches up there. Uh, we used our battle zone concepts. We basically brought in international um, coaches uh, from overseas uh, and, we, and we brought the best kids in um, 
which is still pretty hard to get the best kids out of their states because the coaches have wanted to corral them down there and they still do. And we still battle with that, by the way. But we basically were able to showcase and put something that wasn't in our system available to the players that we thought were going to leave our shores and go and try and win in Asian conditions. And uh, I, I, I know, I'm not sure if Craig Howard's uh, on the line at the moment, but um, you know, people like Craig Howard and people like um, and both Buck or Chris Rogers, you know, they're a product of what GC started in the game sense and challenging players to do it in the middle in training. And, I mean, both of those two now are uh, instrumental in um, how we go about, you know, um, developing our batters to play spin and also our spin balls to bowl spin. So we can come across to India and try and take a few games off you and, win a f and, uh, and, um, and you know, obviously get players and, and fans to watch exciting games. So, yeah, that was... Uh, that was a, probably a big, the big challenge, but again, you know, thanks to, to GC who, who changed a lot of thinking and uh, thanks to a few coaches that I've got in and around me now um, that uh, were, were really keen to move the needle on how we train and what we needed to do and, and not just accept that our backyard was producing the players that we needed to play international. Yes, rubbing the, a bit of salt in the wound. Uh... Series win, probably a bit far-fetched, but yeah, probably a couple of games here and there in India. That's about it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, I think you have touched upon the science of art of fast bowling. You shared some videos with all of us. Uh, there are a lot of things which has happened. But you are a head coach of NCC. Uh, you know, you have a, obviously a much larger uh, portfolio and responsibility. We have discussed, you and me have discussed time and again, and you with your you know, hairs all over, Gagan, there are too many theories of batting, right? And I'm sitting in this room with these so many experts and coaches in the game, and they're talking about their theory. And you would like to objectivize that. What does that mean? How do you think science can play a role? If at all there's a role of science to help you objectivize, how do you see that padding out? And then we can open, up, open it up for discussions. Yeah, try. Well, if I haven't bored everybody so far, I mean, what I'm, what I'm probably trying to touch on is um, there's a lot of conventional wisdom in our game. And, and some of it works. And like conventional wisdom, some of it doesn't work. It gets passed on. And one thing I like about um, going into the science department and, and getting that art and science balance mixed right is things like um, we had in pace bowling uh, and spin. You know, we had uh, we have a track man running around now. Um, the bowlers we were using 3D data analysis, you know. So we were having some really good science give us a lot of information on a lot of the conventional wisdom that was running around. So it was proving some of it, dispelling some of it. And I, I suppose, you know, we were in a pretty good position. We'd moved the radar on fast bowling. Um, we agreed that we needed to do some work in the spin department. And we had some good technology in the background uh, working alongside that. And technology, as we know, is, is so fast moving. You can, you, you've got to be able to jump on. I mean, it's not going to direct what you do, but it, hopefully it's going to enhance what you're thinking and, and give you some really good, solid evidence of why you should do what you're doing as a coach. And, uh, and you shouldn't be shy of that. You should actually embrace it. Um, but I looked at, uh, I looked at batting and... <laughs> I was, oh yeah, I'm, I've got grey. I mean, I've gone grey a lot quicker. Not about fast bowling, head coaching or spin or even fielding, but batting, batting. I mean, right now I could just get rid of all the batting coaches and bring in fast bowling coaches to teach batting. That would be the simple process. And, and I jest, and I uh, know probably Bucky's probably going to throw something at me now. But what I was hearing was a lot of conventional wisdom. And, and a lot of it was really, really good sound knowledge. But the thing is, what I was seeing is batters were changing their stance, their grip, their setup. They were doing things that I thought, wow, why are you doing that for? And then I was talking to the coaches and they couldn't agree on why they were doing it. They were just doing it. And I thought, oh my God. And it came to a head when I was sitting in the change room of JL. And JL was basically running around. And I think there was three coaches talking about one batter and what he should do, how he should change it. And they couldn't bloody agree. And he said, stop it, stop these, there's too many bloody theories on batting. And he was probably one of the ones that had a theory on batting as well. So I sort of kept my mouth 
shut a little bit and thought, how can we help Batty? How can we get a little bit, a little bit of technology, a little bit of process? And I know batting is an art. Yes, I know it's an art. And but there's got to be something. I was thinking, there's got to be something in this technology world that's so fast that can help batting coaches and eventually get to the batsman to make sure that why they change things is for a reason. And uh, I, was, uh, I was pretty keen when uh, GC introduced me to you in India and you came along and you demonstrated this thing that actually could map a bat and in real time show it where it was going. You could change a few things here and there. You could then map it. You could look down instantaneously to see if that change had made a difference. And I thought, wow, that might be something that we can use. And uh, I suppose from then on, you know, we've had some good conversations. We've done a little bit of work in this, but batting coaching, wow. Now that gave me gray hair. And I think from, from what I'm sort of seeing now and, and some of the really great work that's been done um, with, um, with the help of you and your team, but also with some great coaches in, in, um, that I've been working with, which is obviously Buck is, was one of those coaches that embraced this because he likes to get into the detail. He likes to think about the science behind the art. And I think um, we may have hit on something, Gag, and if you can um, answer a few of those questions that we've been asking you, we might have something that actually sets up a process that might give the batsman a chance to train some repeat, train repeatedly the things that they work between their coach and themselves on things that actually get the bat in the right position, at least up until the point of contact to give them the best chance. And I suppose I call that the process of batting. It's bit, for me, it was all like getting the run up right for bowling. Um, it, wasn't gonna, it wasn't going to actually get the ball to go where you want it to go, but it gave you the best chance to do that. And that was all about process. And I suppose for coaches, coaches are about process. We can't go out in the field. We have to set up a process that gets players ready so then they can do things. And that's why I love Battle Zone. Battle Zone was helping that process and getting them into the thinking mode, getting them into those areas where we wanted to go as a coach that the player could then take over and become the coach. And that's the Hippocratical Oath of a coach, isn't it? Not to build dependent relationships, but to build to help someone chase their dream and become the coach themselves. So eventually, you know, I could see that this tool might actually, once the coach had established with the player, with the batsman, a really good way of swinging that bat, they could go away and, and, and instantaneously look and see how it's going, get some really good feedback. And at least up to the point of hitting the ball, they could get some repeatability. And we would stop seeing these changes of grips and 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 feet and bat lifts and swings that people weren't even um, agreeing on anyway, that we could get some science behind it. And uh, I suppose that's, um, that's probably where um, no. I might uh, have a little bit less gray hair if we can get going in this area. And I, I'd love to open it up. And look, I think it's just moving the needle again. It's just moving that needle. I mean, technology is great. It won't drive it, but it'll help it. Having some good people like we've got in, in the audience here now, to try and come up with some ways to to get some uh, to get a little bit of process behind batting uh, and still keep it in that hugely creative art form that you see for the player. Love, for the maybe player. Get a little bit of coaching. Yeah. Uh, no, no. Thank you so much, uh, you know, Chuck. Uh, really, I mean, it was a pleasure listening to you. It was a good, and very interesting kind of a canvas of a coaching journey. Uh, what we can do, uh, guys, is that we can open up either one of your questions right now or uh, I'm pressed on my promise to talk that he had a question. He asked you, it's a very fundamental question which he wanted to ask all of us, all of you rather. And, uh, and then we can open, open up for a discussion on coaching philosophy and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so if that's okay, we, Chuck, are you okay? Sharif, can you please put up the question? So uh, Sharif is going to put up a small question. I request all the coaches in this group to Look through it. Ah, right. Troy, do you want to take them through the question? All right. Okay. A little bit of background here. Obviously, um, we're all dealing with the phenomena of T20 cricket and how that's shaping our young batters and fast bowlers and our fielders coming through. 
And um, I basically, for a coach, you know, um, when we look at this um, particular resource coming through that's being influenced by T20 cricket, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, do we have, how do we, how do we change? Do we have to change our coaching methods? Do we have to adapt? Do we have to move the needle somewhere here when we maybe got an inspired T20 player coming through that playing all these different shots or, and a bowler bowling all these different deliveries for this fantastic high entertainment game? You know, how are our coaching methods going? Do we need to change them? And what I did, and this was uh, just over 12 months ago now, um, I got a, a pretty good group together. And I'm, I'm going to talk specifically about fast bowling now. And this group was a pretty good group. I called them the Pace Cartel. And the meeting was the Pace Cartel group. And what I want to do is I wanted to challenge them with all the things that we're doing in fast bowling. So who is the Pace Cartel? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Who yeah, is the... no, I'm, not, I'm going to give you those key ah, okay. names in one second. But um, I had, uh, I had a, a core group of uh, players and we were going to talk about what we were doing and whether we mean, needed to move the needle on preparing Australian fast bowlers, young fast bowlers. So uh, that, that group consisted of um, the legend himself and the, um, the first person to put Pace Australia together, the first real coach of Pace Bowling and a great mentor of mine, Dennis Lilly. So I had him in the room. Uh, he, he, uh, he was the, uh, the founder of Pace Australia and set up um, the Pace Bowling program, which still runs today. Um, so I had him in the room. Um, and then I had uh, another legend of the, in the room, which was Glenn McGrath. Uh, and I was lucky enough then to also pull in one of the, the speed demons that upset England a few times, um, and that was uh, Mitchell Johnson. And then another legend had just retired and was working with me, and we were trying to answer a few questions uh, one day, and that was Ryan Harris. So there was a pretty good core group of players, absolute legends of the game, that we started to run some information past to see if we were on the right track in what we were teaching young people fast bowlers coming through. So after I sort of presented a lot of information to them, um, brought them up today, um, I presented this question to them. And uh, I'd love to get a bit of a feel on what you think we might have to do or how you think we might, or what you think we might need to do uh, in regards to our coaching. And uh, I specifically think about fast bowling here, what we might need to do with our coaching and what you would do if you were presented with this scenario. Yeah, so you asked specifically with respect to uh, fast boarding to the cartel. Probably this yeah. you're asking in general or specific to fast boarding for this group, this question which you have. Uh, I think, I think the, well, what do you think? I mean, that question there could this is a very be- a generic one actually, if you ask me. All right, let's go to, let's go to, yeah, let's go to the, um, yeah. The generic, I mean, if you can bat it, it's all going to be the same, isn't it? I, I, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's I, just, totally... I just read it out. So, he's uh, Troy says, I'm a 15 year old, love T20, want to get into a Scotch's team and Mumbai Indians team. What do you suggest I should do to get ready? This is a someone, a 15 year old who comes to you, yep. right? you as a coach. So, the question is, what will be your coaching approach? Option A. Coach and teach the fundamentals of the game, which is relevant to all the formats. Option B, coach and teach the skills, which are specific to T20, be it power hitting, death bowling, variations, etc. Option C, coach and teach the skills, which are specific to the four day, five day long game, and then they can later learn the specifics regarding T20. Obviously, guys, there's no right or wrong, is what Troy has told me also. Uh, it would be great if you could think about it for a minute. Uh, given your perspective, you, if you're on a mobile, you just touch, touch that uh, line, if you're on a laptop, just use a mouse and press the submit. It will be interesting to see views and then Troy can. Okay, I'm ready with my answer. <laughs> this is Zubin. Awesome. Uh, Zubin will be the first yeah. one to talk, but Zubin, can you please press there? If you don't what mind. do I need to press? So there are option A, B and C. So Where is that? Uh, it's not on my screen. Can you see the quick poll which is coming on the screen? Guys, can you see no. the quick poll? I'm sorry, one second, Zoom. So sorry. You cannot? Gone away, got, I've got it on my screen. Yeah, we can. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't. Sorry. I'll just talk about it. 
Okay, fine, Zubin. What's your uh, okay? Before you influence anybody else, sorry. So please hold on. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's a blind test. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine with that. Shall we go? One second, please, Zubin. Uh, I think it's more a philosophy rather than yes. a. Yes. So there's no right or wrong. There's point. no right or wrong. Yeah. But hopefully most of you guys have this uh, thing let us know when you're done probably in next 10 seconds we'll call the poll off please submit your answers and then we'll see the poll results and then troy let's let's have zoom in the first thing on what his opinion is yeah okay so my philosophy is you you, won't, you have to oh okay okay i'm not saying anything don't worry it's only a philosophy <laughs> you're not allowed <laughs> to the audience so guys, definitely uh, at, not. The definitely of, not. at the count of 10, we close this poll. 10, 9, 8, 7, 4, mm -hmm. 2, 1. The poll is over. Sharat, can you please share the results now? 74% thinks that coach and teach the fundamentals of the game, which is relevant to all the formats, ir oh. irrespective of the format. 4% thinks that, you know, T specific to T20. 22% thinks that coach and teach the skills which are specific to the four and five day, and then they, they can later learn the specifics regarding T20. Awesome, squeeze towards A, but there are a few people who talk about B and C also. This is fantastic. Zubin, all yours. To start yeah, with. So my, my philosophy is you have to crawl before you walk awesome. and if you and, and that's just in any teaching there are some governing principles there are some governing dynamics of coaching and if you I think at any level at any sport or outside sport as well uh, you know if you go in for an operation you really want to know that the surgeon has studied for 10 years you want to know that he's you know operated 5,000 times before he touches you so in any sport or anything about life, you definitely need to have your foundations in place. And without that, you're just searching in the dark. So in, whether it is batting or whether it is bowling, I think by the time you're 13, 14 years old or whatever, even earlier, you need to know your grammar before you can write great sentences or you will falter. So I think that one of the biggest issues we have around the sport and Troy has uh, addressed some of that is the lack of foundation skills. And I think it's critical that we have these foundation skills in place uh, and then we can build. So for example, all the batsmen who come with all these different issues about the hand and the grip, if they have a strong foundation, you can then build. Then when they reach Justin Langer, they can then, and he has to build you know, a part of that. He doesn't have to start from scratch, which is obviously what he was trying to uh, allude to. And hence, I think, I think if we sort of, whether it is fast bowling, you know, and I'd obviously like to ask Troy a number of questions in terms of uh, return questions, in terms of, uh, you know, what are the priorities at the, at, at, at the center? I mean, in terms of the fast bowling, is it technique? Is it strength and conditioning? Or is it workload management? And how do they prioritize that? Uh, and if we have an understanding of that at the base, at the ground level, at the grassroots level, I think then things start to stack up quite nicely and you can build, you know, the perfect bowler that you're looking to build. Uh, but I think if that, if that foundation doesn't exist and, and how the priorities have been laid out, uh, no matter how much science is applied at that stage, if you're not able to apply the science to that individual person, I think things fall apart. And the other question I had was with the video that was shared, uh, the link that Troy shared, I had two questions on that, which was one, there was a bowler who was bowling like Brett Lee. And if he could understand that better, uh, because I'm presuming that we're not trying to clone bowlers. And the other thing I heard was something about 18 balls being bowled. So if Troy could sort of give us a feel for uh, what those two things was sort of alluding to uh, one was obviously 18 balls means some type of workload management and how that underpins uh, uh, injuries. I'd like to have a sort of a discussion around that if it's possible from a bowling perspective. 
So, uh, uh, Zubin, I take it your answer was yeah. Great. So we'll, we'll we'll yeah let the others answer and then yeah, and then we can if that's okay with you, Zubin. So try okay. to ask this question and uh, request you to answer this. Yeah, Gagan, can I just make a yes, quick please. comment as well? Yeah. So I didn't vote, and the reason I didn't vote was I I I, I believe there's very rarely one answer to anything, and I think it probably it probably goes back to the heart of Troy's point that because we tend to be so categoric in our views on things, particularly batting is why there's so many theories. Uh, so from my perspective, yeah, I, I think there's very rarely one approach. I think it, the philosophy should be the right thing at the right time for the right player. And I think in that scenario that Troy described, I probably share Zubin's view that I would spend most of my time focusing on the fundamentals because they're fundamentals for a reason. But it wouldn't be exclusive because the young player, okay, and if that's a motivational driver for it, you need to spend some time doing that because it's important. But at yeah. the same time, you want to make sure he's adaptable to all of the formats. So for me, it would be a case of proportions. And that's the skill of the coach. Make you picking the right thing at the right time. You know, otherwise, you might as well go and have a relationship with a bowling machine. You know, like the skillful coaching is the right thing at the right time. So I didn't vote, but I wanted to explain why I didn't vote. Awesome. There should have been an option, a mix of all three, probably. Awesome. Yeah. Interesting. So, so the, the the coach's job is to pick the right proportions at the right time. Yeah, I agree with Mo. I think there should have been another question, all of the above, yeah. and uh, depending on the individual and where where the individual was at, particularly as a fifteen year old, um, some might be more advanced than others. But it's up to the coach to work out which percentage of what goes where. I think awesome. it's key also to. You know, if you've got a 15-year-old that's inspired and is coming to you to, um, as a coach to work on a specific element of their game, um, you know, I would spend a little bit of time. Obviously, I answered um, with the, the other 74% as well. Um, but, you know, play to what is inspiring that young player and what, you know, if they're enjoying, you know, trialling new processes and, and reverse sweeps or bowling variations or death bowling, whatever it might be, um, you know, I think that's a great way to engage uh, a younger player. And through that engagement and through the, the fact that you've been um, responsive as a coach, they, that builds the relationship there. And, and then they might sort of come with you when you start talking about some of the other elements that aren't necessarily T20 specific. Very interesting. Anybody would like to add something what Sam and Mo was talking about? Uh, teaching the fundamentals, obviously linking with their aspirations, but yeah. So, Guys, can I just, uh, Woody here? Julian, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I, I agree with everything that's been said there um, by Mo. I think a character can dictate how you bat as well. Hmm. Um, and what's the most important factor for the batter? You know, what's his, what's the most important factor for him? And then you get to know the batter and then you can work, work with him on what's important to him. But I think the character really does dictate how you bat. Um, I, again, the fundamentals are massive because you can't, I get a lot of players come to me to, to hit the ball harder, but they can't bat. You know, their fundamentals are poor. So before you even do that, you've got to, You've got to get the basics right. Once you've got that, once you've got that foundation, then you can build layers on top of that. Interesting. There's a lot of agreement here. Anybody with a contrarian point of view? Come on. No, Gagan, I can, I can uh, relate uh, the exact case with somebody that uh, who's been part of uh, Nepal cricket for, for some time now. Uh, Sandeep Lamisane, if, you, if you've heard, heard of him. Uh -huh. Yeah, the exact the same question... Uh, I mean, I could relate to him because when he came in as a 15-year-old boy to our setup, uh -huh. he was very clear of his approach of playing the Big Bash League. Uh -huh. Because if you if you see his interview at the age of 15 when he was in the camp, what do you want to do? He said he, straight away he put up a point that he wanted to play the Big Bash League. So then, for cha the challenge for us as a coaching staff, I mean, uh, Pubudu was part of that setup as well, uh -huh. was to was to take the road. And uh, I would agree with Mo again, like uh, there, were, there were stages of, of his career that we had to uh, actually segregate. Like we had to go, make him go through the basics and then 
teach him the fundamentals of leg spin and all. Then we have to make him ready to to take it to to the competition level in at the under under 19 World Cups and all. And then there was a stage where he could he could just graduate, becoming specific to T to T20 cricket. So, yeah, again, agree to more like uh, there has to be uh, uh, stages in 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 a 15 year old boy's career. Mm-hmm. We had to take where we have to take three different approaches. That all the other approaches that we spoke about. Interesting. Yes, I'm looking for a country in view. I mean, uh, what Mo said is spot on. Zubin alluded to that. Julian, Benon, Sam, anybody who has a, may, may not be contrary in you, but uh, just to build on it. Could I offer one? Yes, please. Hi folks, I'm, I'm probably the outside of here. Um, my name's Dean. Um, I'm not related to Troy in any way whatsoever. <laughs> um, I would say with those sorts of questions, one of the things you've got to ask is, there's an outcome there that none of you can control. Mm-hmm. You can't control whether that student, uh, that that fifteen-year-old, makes the national team or the international team. You can't control that. So, having someone come to you and say, "I want to make the international team or this national team or this," well, that's good, but you can't control that outcome because there are far too many variables. What you can control is what you teach that uh, or what you coach to that individual. So. I'm always wary uh, of you know people coming to me and saying, "Oh, I wanted to get a degree in X." Well, I can't control that as a as an academic. What I can do is say, "These are the things that you need to do that will give you the best opportunity of reaching your goal." But yeah, I, I, I'd be careful of saying you got to do this and you'll get your outcome because that outcome is a fairly aspirational outcome. Sorry to be the, the no, uh, uh, pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, Dean, for joining in. And uh, you know, uh, Dean, by the way, guys, is uh, academic director of professional experience, School of Education, Federation University in Australia. Uh, interesting perspective and outsider's perspective. Thank you so much, uh, guys. I mean, uh, some of the folks from India. Uh, let me. Oh, Apurva, are you? Are you there? He always has a point of view, an interesting one. Yeah, I'm very much there. Okay. Yes, Apu, Apu. So, what's your point of view to this thing? I mean, I, you... I have a couple of things to put on. I first, I completely agree with uh, Zoops that uh, without the foundation, uh, it's 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 imperative that I mean, if you want to lay him on the right track, you have to lay a solid foundation, and then you can tweak around because I guess uh, kids as they grow and go to the elite level, they become more and more aware about their strengths, but mostly their restrictions, and mm. if a coach can work. Uh, with the player in terms of finding his restrictions and kind of opening up those areas, whether it's batting, bowling, whatever. That's the whole key. But one point I I want to bring here, and uh, because the amount of people I'm meeting and even on the webinars and all, um, and I'm completely in agreement that uh, from a traditional to a constraint base, I guess there's a spectrum where the coaches keep need to keep shifting. Uh, but, you know, the world's come to a stage where if you look at say about 20,000 coaches in India, and it's almost unfashionable if you say, I don't believe in the constraint-based uh, method. And it's becoming a fashion. And uh, the, the message that is lost in the coaches is that you need to be completely thorough with your, with your content and your technical knowledge if you want to actually apply the constraint-based method. And that's the messaging that's lost. If I don't know my technique, I can't apply a constraint. It's like a puzzle maker. If I don't know how to make a puzzle, how am I going to... Uh, make it for a kid to solve it. Uh, and that's the messaging that's lost somewhere in that. Uh, mm. uh, because constraint based is about how you're going to approach the kid or how you're going to get the messaging across. And it's necessarily not about how you learn. So learning, I mean, getting your content right and coaching a kid is two different things. Uh, that's the bridge we need to gap in the messaging. That's what I feel. I, I It's just my opinion. As right. you said, I have an opinion. So... <laughs> No, I just wanted to hear your opinion. Awesome. Uh, anybody else wants to add? Else, uh, we can open up the question. We already have some questions for Zubin, from Zubin to Troy, but... What, what's Troy's answer? It was his question. Yes. Sir. Go well, ahead, Troy. Actually, uh, I was going to give you the basically the fundamental one. Um, I agree with you, Mo. Um, this was basically probably 
if you had to choose something, what would you choose? It was probably more um, the line that uh, the, uh, the cartel came back with. And basically for that 15 year old, they were, they were in agreement that you, you've got to teach the fundamentals. And, and the fundamentals for them, they were specific in, 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 in the two things. One was you had to teach a really good runner and you had to teach how to get the momentum to the target. And if you're going to teach something, those were the two things that you would, you would put into all three of those potential players trying to go somewhere in their careers. So either T20, you know, the, the shorter format or the, or the, the longer format. So they thought that the run up and the momentum was something that they would teach universally across the board. And, and the other one is to teach them how to bowl three lengths. So I suppose that were the, that was the, the two things that they said that they would put into the, um, if they had to choose something, they would choose to teach run up momentum and they would choose to teach uh, um, the ability to hit three lengths. So that was probably where that sat um, in regard to that question. For that particular group, and that was their answer. What's yours? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm basically, uh, keep it nice and open. Um, you know, you, you don't tell someone what to do um, you know, you just give them a you give them a task and see how they go about it. But one of the things with fast bowling is, you know, you need to have some balance. You need to take your momentum to the to the direction of the target, and then just see what happens after that. You know, give them the task, let them go about their work. But if you can give them some balance in their run up, and you can give them a, an option to to make sure that they jump towards their target, I think a lot of the other things start to unfold more naturally than if they had to make adjustments at that last particular point. So I, I think, you know, if I had to teach something um, to a young fast bowler, it would be a really good balance run up and a nice jump into the crease towards the target. Um, and yeah, I'd have some cones down and some things down to, to show them, um, to try and hit some lengths that were gonna actually put the batsman under pressure, which we know if we hit 6.5 meters, most of the batters start getting a bit nervous and we, you know, we take the, uh, we give them the, the hardest, um, the hardest ball to, to, um, to play. So, even, so I, even, I think GC, yeah. even I think you told me, and I'll remember GC's story, and I'll always remember it when he was um, talking to the great Sir Donald Bradman, and he asked the, the, the Don, and please, GC, correct me if I'm wrong, but he did ask him, um, was there any bats, any, any bowl that he did? And I think he took a little bit of a pause and he said, yeah, the one that could hit the top of my off stump. So it sort of made me start to think, well, if that ball was going to upset the greatest batsman in the world, then maybe we should bowl that more often. Yeah, I think uh, that, that was pretty close to the, uh, the line, Troy. I think the full ball was the, the, his answer um, because it could get him out bowled, LBW nicked off every every form of dismissal. And one of the things that I think is interesting is we, we've all answered that question without knowing what the player's needs are. We've answered the scenario. So, so surely the answer is whatever the player needs. So if the rest of the question said, this player's got outstanding fundamentals, then you might have changed your answer. So for me, the answer has to start with what the player needs. And that's why I think it could be a bit of everything in the right proportions. It'd be like if you were trying to teach maths and you wanted to teach... The, out, the outcome was complex algebra. Well, if they haven't got the time tables, then you need to start with that. But if they're nailing that, then you evolve. So the answer has to come back to what the player needs. And I therefore, it, it could be a bit of everything. And Mo, I think it goes to what is the task first? What is the task and what does the player need to create, to, to execute that task? So I'd go to the task. Whatever the task you've got, then you know, you, you've got a certain amount of skills that are going to be able to achieve that. So mm. then you'll know mm. what... What, what they're missing. So you can profile then, can't you? Because obviously the fundamentals of fast bowling is to take wickets. Or in some places, you know, the task may be to stop scoring. Um, so but the, mm. fundamentally the game is to take wickets. And, uh, and to do that, I suppose, the ball that we were just talking about, that full ball that Greg talked about, the one that the, the, the greatest batsman in the world had trouble with was, um, was uh, the one that was going to hit the top of the stump. <laughs> task and the needs i think that's probably and that's what coaching is right i mean coaching is not just about very interesting uh 
Troy, uh, Zubin had put his um, so I you know, handkerchief I first. The question, I thought the question, first of all, was related to T20 cricket, wasn't it? Yeah, the question that was... I, no, the question was... Not that I was... I haven't got the question, but yeah, yeah. I thought there was something about T20 cricket. Exactly, right? exactly. So it was about this guy who aspires to play T20, what would be a coaching philosophy, net-net. Right. Yeah. So, uh, Troy, do you want to go ahead and answer Zubin's couple so, of questions? Yeah, the question I had, Troy, was just in terms of your priorities with regards fast bowlers uh, at the NCC. Um, you know, obviously there's technique, there's strength and conditioning, and there's workload management, and just your thoughts around what comes first, and you know, and how you guys approach it. But well, going back to um, my bit's, um answer is what. Um, there's five, five. There's obviously five fundamentals that you're looking at, and you want to make sure holistically that you, you, you're taking all that into consideration. Um, and I, I suppose for us, is you know what they're getting ready for, where they're going to. You know, we have some, um, we have some differences of opinions. You know, some are getting ready to to go at, at that age. I'm talking about the age now, which is about 19, isn't it? So yep. we might have to start to fundamentally. Um, be a bit more specialised in where we need to go, depending on what that athlete is wanting, and, and obviously what the what the state are wanting from that athlete as well. So, um, I, I would say that I would they'd be banking on well, once we know what we, we we're doing here, um, once we got the what the athlete wants uh, and what they need, we've we've skilled that up. You, you're definitely looking at. Um, touching on all those five characteristics, uh, all those five fundamentals. Um, and if we took, if we took the age, knowledge that... Yep, yeah, fastballs, sorry. The fastballs at that age, one of the biggest killers of fastballs at that age is, um, is, a, is stress fractures of the back. So that's, that's a killer. Uh, we know roughly um, through our research and what we look at that there are some key things that you need to avoid um, if you, if you uh, want to look after a, a developing young fast bowler that has uh, a spine that is um, is pretty susceptible to workload or too much work. A stress fracture is the body's inability to handle the work that you give it. So we would be mindful that, um, you know, we're, we're setting that bowler up for a, a, for success in, in making sure that we look after their, their, um, their work that they can handle. So looking at some of those skills that maybe are missing, you know, is it, is it their line and length? So we were looking at, as I said, looking at their ability to hit three lengths as being a pretty important fundamental skill that they should be able to execute um, from a fast bowling perspective. So, you know, the fitness, the three lengths definitely would be some of the things that we would um, prioritize. Right. So just on this, uh, so, you, so your research would tell you uh, what happens to the body at various age group levels? Yeah, well, yes, does up until about the age of 23, 24. Um, if you're uh, if you counter rotate more than about 40 degrees, and uh, you laterally flex more than about 40 degrees, and your workload is is um, to a point where your body can't accept it, then you know you 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 break down. Um, so, you know, like so, with this knowledge that you guys have now, um, if we transport it back to when the kid is 13 years old or something. Uh, you, is that is that what what do you know now? Is that sort of going into what these kids are learning now in terms of twelve, thirteen? I think so. I think there's um, there's definitely a, we know that uh, you get the preparation wrong uh, or too much too often um, and not enough recovery, then you, you know you're setting them up for um, for injury. Um, they just don't adapt like a, a hardened bone does. So. So yeah, we would be looking at um, just trying to at least get the coach to understand that um, you know we, we've got to be mindful of the work that we're giving young fast bowlers. So again, that makes it even more important when you're coaching them that you're coaching them the skills um, that are going to help them um, actually hit three lengths. I suppose that's what the cartel said, you know, hit three lengths. Um, but yeah, definitely mindful that you wouldn't be. Uh, over, over um, doing the, the bowling to such an extent where they're going to put themselves at risk of, of a stress fracture, which is basically trying to take them out for you know six to eight months or even you know most of the time it's a year out of their development. So, 
So this, right. so this uh, obviously this perennial debate on you know uh, workload management. Uh, your views on sort of how much do they need to bowl? Obviously dependent on the individual, but I mean you know there's obviously the old school which said you know the more you bowl the better you get, and then how does that sort of transport across from all the knowledge that we've now sort of acquired? Yeah, I think um, yeah, I think that was a bit of a conventional wisdom. The, the more you bowl, um, you, you've got to be mindful that we are talking about a physical um, capability here, um, and not just a skill. It's physical, mm -hmm. and it's uh, and again, it's going to be more individual to that particular um, young fast bowler. But we know that those young fast bowling bones aren't going to respond like old fast bowling bones. And sure, we can adapt, uh, and adaptation is part of our evolution. But what we understand is that you've got to still know that a stress fracture is the body's inability to put up with the work you're giving it. And if you get a stress fracture, you've overdone it. And that's probably too late. So some of the, some of the things in place now, um, you know, basically getting, getting, a, getting some good work into them, but giving them some good recovery time as well, are probably the things that um, we would most likely do now. Yes, uh, we are 10 minutes over run. There was one question which I overheard. I don't want to stop that and then we can probably... Uh... Troy, I was just wondering if... Um, one of the things I'm familiar with some of the data uh, about stress fractures and um, injuries to bowlers, but one of the things we don't know is what are the difference between left-handers and right-handed bowlers in terms of injuries because... We know from baseball, uh, the data from baseball shows there is a difference between left-handers and right-handers. And I, I look at the cricket uh, stats and the biomechanical uh, work um, and even some of the, the stats that were shown at the start of today, and it didn't distinguish between left-handed batters and right-handed batters or bowlers. And we know there are differences. Um, so is there? have you got any latest data about Injuries to left arm fast bowlers and right arm fast bowlers. Thanks. Um, the, the, I, well, I, I assume there is some of that data, and, and John would probably be um, able to answer that question probably um, with more more detail than me. But I think what we're, we're sort of looking at there too, Dean, is is we're still talking about a, a spine of of an adolescent um, yeah. um, young player, and and. and I still think that there's, sure, there's going to be some differences between um, one person to the next, but in the general um, data that we're looking at, that spine is still not capable of handling the workload um, that you're giving it uh, because of the way it's growing, going through growth spurts, and, and just the softness and the malleability of that, that bone as it's trying to formulate and get to a hardening process where, you know, when you get to that sort of that 22, 23 year old. Um, um, age back where they've actually um, formed their, their spine and it can take a lot more effort, whether they're right-handers or left-handers. I think... So I don't know if that answers your question, Dean, but um, I, I could go back and find that out and, and see if we can pull that data out, but we're basically looking just as a spine uh, from a left or a right-hander being the same. Yeah, because if we look at crick, uh, we look at baseball, um, in left-handers, there's about a 10% difference in rotation from a left-hander to a right-hander, uh, generally across um, all left-handers, which is enough to give them a protective benefit. That is the left-hander compared to the right-hander, which is an interesting um, difference. Um, and so knowing that about fast bowlers might help us uh, and help coaches uh, when they're dealing with fast bowlers and uh, left-handed bowlers and right-handed bowlers. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Something. If I can dig some data up, Dean, and I'll, and I'll shoot it your way to see if they've actually gone hard. I mean, somebody else might know on the line here. Um, does anybody else know if, uh, uh, if that uh, data? John is not there. I don't, Paris, Paris Mamre is there. I don't know if you have any such uh, Paris views on this that the left-hander and right-hander? Uh, we're trying, uh, as, it, as uh, Troy also said, 
I think uh, we're trying to collect right now at, at the NCA as well. We're, we're working with a lot of young kids. And something which is very constant is obviously a lot uh, relates to in terms of structure that we have. Is uh, And one problem that we've encountered is the, the workload has been a major issue uh, for us uh, at the NCA. Because once the kid has NCA, it's a very less period that he's working at. Uh, given the time frame that we work with him, it's pretty less. And once he moves on to, to the state or the under-19 level, whatever level that he's playing, is the monitoring of the workload becomes a problem for us. Because we lose control for that kid. And then again, he goes back to the state, comes back, you work, with the, work on certain things with the kid, goes back, again, uh, the same issue, uh, uh, encounter the same issue, comes back to us. And then similarly for us, we go back to the same. We start from the same. So one of the things is, uh, especially I thought, uh, was uh, the problem that we encountered was man workload management was uh, important. Uh, as the other point uh, in terms of the left-handers and the right-handers, uh, honestly, not much of info that has, that has come to us because most of the kids that we have out here uh, that been to the NCA, uh, a lot more the right-handers, the bowlers that we have, a lot more right-handers for the younger kids coming through, not mm -hmm. so much for the left-handers uh, at the young. So, so not really much of info on that. But will be interesting. To see. Uh, How do you come up with a consistent measure for workload, though? Um, is it uh, balls bowled in a game, bowled in training? What about during their leisure time? So it, it's interesting when you say workload, but how do you define workload? Yeah, it's it's the workload is uh, eventually everything in terms of the the net sessions, the match, is especially. Okay. I think, uh, and that's what we're trying to do is trying to collect as much data as we can right now, which come up with an app for the kids. And what we're doing is after every session, maybe whatever they've done in a day, during the season, during the off season, how many balls that, how many balls that are bowled during the nets in the matches, we're trying to collect as much data as we can. And uh, and trying to see where where, do, where does the red flag comes in. We, we're just trying to see how many, uh, trying to as much, as I said, collect data. That's important. I think it's eventually it's everything for me is, uh, the net session is important, how many bowls in the nets, the match session as well, and collecting that data. I think the workload management for me is not only maybe then heuristic, and I'm not sure, I think uh, other people have maybe have views on in terms of number of balls that they bowl in, in uh, every net session, maybe 18 or 24. Maybe that's something we can debate about. And I think personally it will depend on every individual. Uh, yeah. But we're trying to collect as much data as we can in every net session, every session. Whatever session that is, maybe a net session or a match. Yeah. I, 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 I did indicate up there uh, on the questions that if we don't know the arm length, we don't know the forearm length or the humerus length, we cannot work out velocity. And so you may have a young player who has different, you know, compared to uh, another player, different arm lengths. Therefore, they can have greater velocities, and that controls the stress on the arm. So. Whilst I understand workload, and I think it's an important one, some of the other anatomical differences between kids will affect whether or not they are susceptible to um, injury. Um, so I think maybe as cricket coaches, we need to go beyond that and start to look at young players and look at them physically to see whether or not they are suitable for fast bowling. Uh, that, I know that's controversial, but just a suggestion. Dean, uh, you know, uh, hearing your views, I'm sure you obviously have uh, done a bit of thinking through and probably have done some work on it. Uh, it will be actually lovely, one of some of these topics if you can take up and let's say guys like John, Paros, Troy, right? And come in and we can actually discuss this topic itself at length because some of the topics which, which you just raised about depending on the arm's length and the arm velocity and so on and so forth, something probably one need to first understand that correctly with the nomenclature and then think about it. So, I, I mean, uh, I have your details uh, from Troy. I will reach out to you and see whether sure. we can actually have a session, you know, created along with you, John, guys like Troy, Paris, and so on and so forth. Yeah? yeah. Look, I'm not a biomechanist. I'm a sports psych, but um, I do think, you know, I do think about things come from different angles. And, yeah, I don't, I don't mean that, uh, that no, way, but yeah. look you. at the problem different ways. Awesome. No, I think uh, on that note, uh, you know, I just want to say one thing which I heard from somebody uh, very, very, 
uh, somebody who has created a huge impact. And he said, in God we believe for everything else, get data. I think that's what it's coming down to, everything. Uh, on that note, guys, uh, I wish you a fantastic, fantastic weekend. Thank you so much for joining. Troy, can I thank you more? Beautiful insights, amazing insights. Uh, uh, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, have a great weekend, guys. Uh, uh, stay safe and take care. Bye. Thanks, Kagan. Thank you so much. Thanks, Troy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Next time. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. It was very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.